hi everyone. Um, good morning and thank you for joining the webinar on uh, work-life balance. Uh, my name is Tenille and I'm the Geelong Chambers dedicated mental health clinician um, consultant. Um, now before we commence today, um, I'd like to acknowledge the Wadawurrung people who are the traditional owners of the land upon which I stand today. Um, and also acknowledge all of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are part of the Greater Geelong community. Um, I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, for they hold the memories, the traditions, the culture and the hope of their people. I'd also like to thank the Chamber's platinum partner, Pixel, um, and also say thanks to our gold and silver partners who are shown here on these slides. Okay, so for anyone um, logged on today who I haven't yet met, um, again, I'm Tenille. So I am working at the Geelong Chamber as part of the Partners in Wellbeing program. Um, so I'm providing one-on-one -on -one sessions and, co and consultations to business owners, their staff and their families um, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, but also beyond. Um, and yeah, this uh, webinar is um, part of that, that offering as well. Okay, so before we begin today, um, I'd like everyone, I'd like to invite everyone to approach this webinar with uh, a growth mindset. Um, so for those of you who haven't heard of this term before, um, the growth mindset is a concept from the psychologist Carol Dweck. Um, so essentially what she posits is that our capacities, knowledge and talents can be improved um, with persistence and effort and that by embracing this idea and rejecting the idea that particular characteristics, levels of talent and abilities are fixed or unchangeable, we're more likely to orientate towards self-improvement, rise to challenges and see failures as learning opportunities rather than a reflection of personal inadequacies or deficiencies. So at the core of it, developing your capacity to care about yourself, um, your mental health and your well-being is learning and most importantly implementing particular strategies and habits. So in this setting uh, a growth mindset means thinking about the strategies discussed as learnable skills that with persistence and practice can be incorporated um, into your routines mastered and used to help you work towards developing a sense of balance and wellness in life. So many of the strategies uh, discussed here, um, they're well tested and pretty well known. Um, you may even be aware of some of them from other talks or presentations that you have attended. Um, however, often although people walk away from these sessions um, with the best of intentions, uh, they don't go on to implement the strategies um, or they do implement them, um, but fail to maintain them when things start to get busy um, which is exactly when these strategies are really needed the most and are most useful. So you've probably come to this webinar today for one of two reasons. So either you're a leader who'd like to know more about the importance of work-life balance um, for the maintaining, helping to maintain the well-being of your employees, um, or you yourself feel that there's an imbalance between your work life and, and life life um, that's causing tension and stress. Um, so either way, as we move through the discussion today, um, I'd like you to keep in mind that maintaining a healthy work-life balance um, is a skill set that can be learnt and practised and perfected over time. Um, so um, if you would like to learn about the growth mindset and how it can assist you in other areas of your life as well, then I highly recommend Dr. Dweck's book, uh, Mindset, so changing the way you think to fulfil your, your potential. Um, okay, so with that in mind, uh, let's talk about work-life balance. So what is work-life balance? What does it look like? Okay, so for the purposes of this discussion today, um, and put very simply, 
um, work-life balance, or as it's sometimes re also referred to, work-life harmony, um, involves adjusting and managing your day-to-day -day activities in order to achieve a sense of balance between the time that you spend at work um, and the time that you spend living the rest of your life. But before we get it too deep into the discussion, um, I'd like you to answer a question for me. Um, now, I'm not sure if anyone here has ever used Mentimeter before, but if not, I'll talk you through it. It's really simple. Um, so I'd like you to grab your phone or open up a new tab on your computer um, and go to menti.com and type in this code. Um, so 45481662 um, and type in your answer to this question. Um, so what are some of the things that are important to you outside of the workplace? I'll give you a few minutes, um, but let me know if you're having any issues logging on. Walks in nature, yeah. Family and friends and yoga, absolutely. Tanil, could you just give us the rest of that um, that code for the site, please? Yeah, sure. So four five four eight one six six two. Four five four eight one six six two. There you go, guys. So as you can see, as you're typing it in, it's all coming up there on the screen. So, you know, we've got a lovely word, word cloud happening there um, about some of these things that are important to, to everyone. And as more and more people um, share the same sentiment, those words will actually start to get bigger. So we can see that family is a really important one there. So we can see a few different responses. But family is generally a pretty, pretty big one for most people. Friends, relax, relaxation, positive relationships, yeah, the outdoors. And you can see that there are a few different answers there. Um, so one of the things that I want to highlight with this activity um, is the fact that things, um, what you do outside of the workplace is, it's a very personal thing. And these needs, priorities and preferences are really going to be quite different for everyone. Um, and they actually change quite a lot over time as well. And this means that creating a sense of work-life balance is really individual because each person has different needs and different things in their lives that, de that de make demands on their time and energy um, outside of work. So you can have a look at some of those there. Now, you may have seen this or some, something similar to it before. Um, so what you're looking at here um, are the eight dimensions of wellness. So not every dimension is uh, actually encompasses um, a complete sphere of life, but all dimensions of wellness do need our attention in order for us to really flourish. So most of the time, the occupational part of this pie is not actually in conflict with all these other dimensions. So, in fact, jobs can really contribute hugely to these other areas. And, you know, thinking particularly there about that financial, um, environmental, intellectual and social and financial aspects. Um, so when it's going well, work can be a really huge booster to our overall sense of 
well-being. However, even if things are travelling well at work, sorry, I can see that there's... Even when things are travelling well at work, when it does start to eat into or invade the time that we can spend doing all of those things that we just talked about, um, we can end up with quite a, quite a large problem. So because aside from reducing the time that we have to spend on all of those other things um, that we really value, like our family and our health, our friends, these other um, those other activities are also a way for us to actually pay attention to these well-being needs. So when work starts to take up all the room, the time and the emotional energy that we have, um, it also becomes our only avenue to satisfy these emotional and psychological needs that we have. Um, and then we're in a position where things can really um, fall apart quite quickly. Um, imagine, for example, that something at work goes wrong, uh, the pressure mounts, or we just have a series of tasks that we need to undertake that we really don't enjoy or they're just outright unpleasant which, you know, from time to time happens in, in the workplace. So having multiple activities and interests that fulfil our wellbeing needs provides flexibility um, and it assists us with building resilience. Um, we don't have all of our eggs in one basket, so to speak. Now, to be clear, like healthy is not splitting your time evenly between your hobbies, interests, families and work. It's about finding that point of harmony within the dimensions that fits into your personal priorities and values. Um, and when you've found what works best for you, uh, maintaining it requires work, active awareness and commitment, especially when things get busy and stressful. So just quickly, um, here are some of the things that workplaces and, and managers should also be staying aware of um, and mindful of in relation to work life, the work-life balance needs of their employees. Um, the requirements of a role, uh, whether they feel able, whether the employee feels able to honestly discuss their struggles and, and seek support in the workplace, um, how intensely the employee tends to work, what their working style is. Um, how much they and others really value their work, whether they enjoy being at work on a day-to-day -day basis, um, and how often they get the chance to relax or turn off from work. This is why it's really crucial for managers to get to know their employ employees on a personal level. So knowing an employee can really help managers to figure out how to help staff perform at their best and give them an understanding what each of their staff are likely to be able to take on without risking burning them out. So if your staff are comfortable talking to you honestly about how they're traveling, you're also more likely to actually get a heads up if something is going on for a person um, and you and the employee can have a proactive conversation about how to work through it and negate or reduce the potential impact that it might have on their work and the workplace. I think that, um, you know, sometimes, and um, I have heard this a lot, employers can feel that these conversations can be really awkward, um, but it actually makes a huge difference to people that their employers know what's going on for them and are willing to support them. People can expend a lot of emotional and cognitive energy trying to hide their struggles and distress from others. And they can obsess about what might happen or how people will receive, perceive them if someone notices what's going on. So a lot of the time, an honest conversation with a staff member can in itself actually be enough um, to help them to get back on track as it allows them to focus their energies on what to do to manage the, the situation or to recover instead of what I need to do in order to hide it from everyone around me. Um, now, if a person's uh, work-life um, balance is really poor, um, and this goes on for a long period of time, 
what tends to happen is that their sense of overall well-being becomes diminished. Their stress levels start to rise and they begin to run the risk of experiencing some very real emotional, psychological and physical consequences because of that prolonged stress. This video um, that I'm about to play here uh, gives you a bit of an idea about what can happen when work-life balance is really out of whack um, and individual well-being needs are being ignored or pushed aside. Just um, need to... Okay. What does it mean for you to be burned out at work and how can it affect your health? I'm Dr. David Geyer, orthopedic surgeon, and I want to help you feel and perform your best, regardless of age, regardless of injuries, and yes, workplace burnout. Burnout is actually now a legitimate medical syndrome. The World Health Organization just listed it in what's called the IDC-11 that will come out soon, their classification of diseases. It's a legitimate medical syndrome, uh, so that means, unfortunately, it's a real problem. You know, this isn't just oh, I'm not feeling good at work one day. This is a real issue. They call it basically um, chronic stress that's not been successfully managed, chronic stress at your workplace. And it has really three categories of symptoms, energy depletion and emotional exhaustion, uh, increased distance or feelings of distance from your work or negative feelings about your work, and decreased work performance or work productivity. So in simpler terms, exhaustion, cynicism, and feelings of ineffectiveness. Now, one of the challenges with workplace burnout, and this is across spectrums, in another video we're gonna talk about how common workplace burnout is, but it, across industries, whether it's medicine, whether it's the corporate world or any other uh, workplace environment, people don't wanna get help. They don't wanna ask for help. They don't wanna be seen as weak. So they're feeling all this stress from doing all this and all the other causes that lead to workplace burnout but rather than asking for help and potentially being seen as weak because maybe they need a break, which I would argue is not true, they respond by working harder, leading to more and more stress. And that builds up over time and can lead to a lot of negative symptoms. So as you're watching this, just think about some of these symptoms of burnout and ask yourself if some of these apply to you. Chronic fatigue, frequent irritability, difficulty sleeping, brain fog, forgetfulness, depression, anxiety, dreading going to work some days, rolling your eyes when customers or patients or your coworkers complain to you, mentally checking out in meetings, spreading negativity in the workplace, wondering why you started working at this job or in this career in the first place and dreaming of retiring in a few years, let alone wondering how you're gonna work 20 or 30 more years. And all these symptoms and all the stress that results and some of the loneliness and isolation that you can feel because you don't want to get help and you don't want to talk about some of your feelings and some of your symptoms, that can lead to a lot of negative health effects as well. We know that weak social connections and loneliness are associated with a reduction in lifespan equivalent to smoking 15 cigarettes per day. It's associated with a greater reduction in lifespan than obesity. Loneliness is associated with cardiovascular disease, depression, dementia, anxiety. At work, loneliness reduces task performance. It impairs reasoning and decision making. And here's the problem. 63% of U.S. employees that face this chronic stress respond to it by engaging in unhealthy behaviors that lead to things like substance abuse. And we don't have numbers on this across the workflow, but there's a really scary statistic when it comes to my world, and that is physicians. About 400 physicians each year take their own lives. Doctors currently have the highest suicide rate of any profession in society. So we have to do a better job at recognizing burnout in the workplace and take steps to correct course immediately. In our next video, we're going to talk about how common burnout is and what some of the common causes are so that as we move forward, we're, when we talk about some of the ways to treat this and the ways to prevent it, we really know what we're up against and who to target, how to target, how to make our difference in the best way. If you like. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you.
Okay. So burnout is a really serious concern and I'm not sure if anyone here has met or spoken to someone who's experienced burnout. Um, but what I can tell you is that people can really just come to a point where they wake up and they can't get out of bed. Um, and it can take a really long time um, for them to work through it and to recover. Um, and when any mental health concern is brought about by pressures of work, it can also take a really long time um, for the person to actually re rebuild a sense of trust with their employer um, enough to feel comfortable being in the workplace again. So it can have really wide ranging um, and long term effects. But before all of this occurs, there can be some really early warning signs um, that things are starting to get on top of the person. Um, and this can include things like trouble thinking clearly, um, memory issues, uh, racing thoughts, um, feeling really tight in, in the muscles, so neck and back, um, you know, eating more or less than usual, um, having sleep disturbances, um, so not being able to get to sleep, sleeping too much, feeling really exhausted all the time, having dreams or, or nightmares. Um, procrastinating can be another one that's that's really big as well for people and of course you know using alcohol um, cigarettes and drugs to be able to to relax or, or switch off so these symptoms are really incredibly unpleasant um, for the individual um, and if they continue um, this will actually start to become pretty apparent in the workplace as well. So there may be an increase in absenteeism, presenteeism, um, which is showing up to work despite really not being well enough to be there, um, low motivation or decreased productivity, um, becoming really hypercritical of others um, and expressing, uh, experiencing and, and expressing sadness, apathy, irritability, bitterness, uh, anger, um, resentment, and dis displeasure. Um, so you can see that all of this can create a real knock-on effect by impacting morale, morale uh, culture, and also workload distribution. Okay, so we'll go back to Menti <laughs> um, in a second, but uh, the good news is that there's a lot of things that can really be done um, both by individuals and by workplaces before things get um, really bad. Um, and the first and, and most important of which is for workplaces and individuals to commit to developing and maintaining a healthy and supportive workplace where work-life balance is a genuine priority um, and an integral part of the workplace culture. You know, I think that's really key because if a person is in a culture at work where they believe that they need to be working long hours, um, putting in, you know, 50 hour weeks in order to be able to get ahead, if that's the culture of the workplace, then that culture can really suck people in. And it's very difficult then to say no, um, because it feels almost threatening to, to your career and your progression. Um, now, for an individual, on an individual level, there's really one thing that you really need to know in order to start ensuring that you're able to reduce and manage your stress and start to create some of the boundaries that you need to establish and maintain, to maintain um, a healthy work-life balance. Um, so we'll head back to Mentimeter. Um, and this time the question is, you know, what do you value in life? So grab your phone again or open a new tab um, on your computer and go to Menti. Um, code's the same, so hopefully it's still in there from before. Um, and then just, um, yeah, type in your answers and we'll have a look.
Lovely. And you can see that big family again. Um, yeah, and work. Relationships, nature, um, happiness, that sense of achievement, yeah. So freedom, time alone, absolutely. So let's head back into this. So what we can see from your answers, that they're pretty reflective of the answers that we gave before. Um, when we're discussing um, what you'd like to spend your time on outside of work. So, of course, work has come back into it because it's more of a, just a value question. Um, and a lot of people do value work. They value the time that they spend at work. They value the connections that they have there. Um, but it does say to me that um, we would all really like to be dedicating our time and energies to the things that we most value in life. Um, which leads me to the real question, which I'm not going to have any of you um, type it in anywhere. Um, so it's just something for a bit of ponder. Um, but, you know, do you believe that on a day-to-day -day basis, your schedule um, dedicates enough of your time and energy um, for you to the things that you, you most value in life? Um, and that really brings us to, to these keys to making and striking a, a really good work-life balance. Um, because for some of you, the answer may be yes. And if so, that's great. That's perfect. Um, but if the answer is no, then, you know, good news. You've just taken the first step to constructing um, a healthy work-life balance. Um, because the first step is really identify your values. Uh, what is it that you value? What is it that you really, um, you know, is really important to you? Um, and then the next step is setting small goals for yourself which align with these values that you have um, where you want to spend this time and, and this energy um, so if you're talking about spending time in nature um, which was something that i saw there you know you might be able to park your car in a place that means you'd have to walk through a park or garden to get from work every day um, or take lunch in a park or at the waterfront, for example, um, you know, these goals don't have to be large. They're just a kind of homage to these um, aspects of your life that, that potentially you would like to give a little bit more energy and time to. Um, you know, if your answer was family, that really big one in the middle is something that we, we all value, you know, so many of us do value so much. Um, you know, it may be developing a small goal around quality time that's manageable and, and really special to you and your family so for example everyone spends 10 minutes together talking about their day um, or a regular extended family get together so the next thing here is managing your time um, and you know, this is something that I know that there was um, there was a really good webinar on um, a little bit earlier in the year. Um, so hopefully it's something that we're all across. Um, but, you know, reviewing your job tasks every day, um, marking them up in terms of uh, priority. Um, you can number them. You can use an ABCD E system or colour code them if you prefer. So it's about whatever is going to work for you. Um, and then always, always start with the things that have to be done first, the things that are going to have the biggest consequences of not getting done. Um, and it's really important, I think, in that, in that list of tasks as well, to include the things that you do have to do outside of the office. Um, so the things that you have to do um, with your family or the things that you've committed to. Um, and remind yourself of these. Um, if you are thinking about staying back at work, because it's important to remember there's also consequences for not doing these other things that, um, you know, are reflective of your value, these other things that you've made commitments to do. Um, and those consequences may relate to your relationships uh, with your partner, your children, your friends, um, or your health. For example, if you decide, you know, just get the gym, stay at work, get this done. Um, 
you know, the next one here is about creating a boundary. Um, so creating a boundary between work time and personal time is something that is really easy to say and it can be very difficult to do. Um, but, you know, it's really important wherever possible um, and having a routine of some time of some type between finishing work and moving into after work um, because that can give you a kind of uh, little ritual to do is, you know, I know when I arrive at work, I walk to work in my sneakers and I change over to my work shoes when I get here um, and I take off my work shoes before I go home. Um, and that's my little ritual of just saying, okay, when I've got my work shoes on, I'm at work. Um, these little rituals can be really important because it gives your, your mind that kind of point where, you know, this is work time and this is home time. And you can build those into working from home as well. So something that you, you might do is maybe just spending five or 10 minutes, even playing games on your phone, going for a walk. Or, or listening to some music, um, just to separate that time that you've spent at the computer working from the time that you're going to go into spending in your home life or seeing your friends or doing other things. Um, it's, um, you know, I know this term is so popular now, um, but it's a circuit breaker, so to speak. Um, if you do make the choice to stay at work and to work over time, um, do it consciously. You know, a lot of people um, end up just kind of getting into a task and just kind of trying to push through um, and they don't actually necessarily sit there and think about, am I making, you know, is this a choice? Am I making this choice? Um, actually check in around your expectations, around how much uh, you're really going to be able to complete in terms of the task, like in the next, you stay an hour, two hours, how much time you actually need to give to this task in order to actually make a dent in it and weigh up whether having a night off and approaching it fresh in the morning with a good night's sleep and having had a bit of a, a break um, is actually going to allow you to be more efficient um, and do this task in a, to a higher quality um, because maybe you could come in early the next day and give that, that hour in the morning um, or make a plan, you know, to take, that time back on another day um, but you know it's not that I think we all end up with situations where we sometimes do need to or feel that we need to actually complete work outside of hours because of a deadline um, but it is about trying to make that decision consciously and, and doing it in the best way that's really going to let us um, perform at our best um, and also take back that time um, if we can Um, and oops, I think I missed a slide here. Oh, no. Um, so work on developing an optimistic attitude. Um, so this is, this actually, this can be done. And I've got the, you know, beware of um, toxic positivity. Um, I would also call it you know, unhelpful positivity which is just when you know we believe that no no matter how dire or difficult a situation is we should stay cheery um there are real benefits to being an optimist and to in engaging in positive thinking and challenging negative thinking um you know in our day-to-day -day lives um however you know difficult emotions exist for a reason they're not the enemy um you know, they are, they're, they're part of our, our makeup, they're part of being human. Um, and to be perfectly honest, some situations, um, you know, are just, they're just plain awful. <laughs> um, and adopting a, a falsely positive facade um, won't necessarily help you navigate those situations. Um, so, I mean, unfortunately, we don't have time to go into it in depth properly here. Um, however, if you do have an interest in developing like a healthy, optimistic attitude, um, I would certainly recommend Dr. Um, Silverman's book on learned optimism, which is here on this slide. It's it's a really powerful, um, uh, not very long, short book um, about the research around 
um, learned optimism um, and how to adopt that. Um, maintaining your health. Uh, so this is one I'm sure you're all aware of. Um, so in terms of the benefits, taking care of your physical health is really one of the most powerful things that you can do for your overall well-being. Okay. Um, so there's numerous and well-documented physical benefits to living a healthy lifestyle, um, which I'm sure you're all aware of. Um, the research has also shown the benefits of a healthy diet and regular that benefits healthy diet and regular excess exercise has on improving the symptoms um, of mild and moderate depression and anxiety as well. So very simply, your mind lives in your body um, and anything that you're doing to improve your body's health also in, in improves your situation for your mind. And finally, don't suffer in silence. Um, so there's no such thing um, as a superman or woman. Um, and although dropping, um, dropping that persona can be really difficult, um, especially in the world of work and business, um, the truth of it is we all need a little bit of help sometimes. Um, so if you're struggling to get the work side of things under control, um, probably first I'd try explaining a situation to your boss or supervisor. Um, you know, most unattainable work situations can usually be alleviated or managed in some way. Um, but if it's going on unnoticed, they haven't really noticed that it's happening, it may take some assertiveness on your part to bring it to their attention and at least give them the opportunity to be able to work through it with you. Um, however, if um, a balanced life kind of continues to be quite elusive, um, or you're feeling that you're experiencing chronic stress and, and maybe have been for a long time, you know, it, it could be time to reach out to a professional. So you can take advantage of maybe um, your employee assistance program uh, if you have one. Um, at the moment, the Geelong um, Local Council um, has opened up access to their EAP program um, for people in the community if you are struggling um, so I'd probably have a look at that. Um, if you don't have an AIP program um, at your work, so employee assistance program. Um, so you can also speak to your GP about what options you might have through Medicare, um, or you can also contact myself. Um, so my details are on the slide, um, and all the services through the Partners in Wellbeing program are free and confidential. Now, just to finish up, I just want to leave you with a quote from the late Stephen Covey. Um, so he's the author of The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. So if we keep doing what we're doing, we're going to keep getting what we're getting. Um, and it's just another way of basically saying uh, for things to change, we have to change them or we have to change. So if you are at a point in your life where things really feel like they have to change, um, or if you believe that one or more of your employees are there, um, then I hope you implement something from today or reach out to talk further about what you might be able to do. Um, so taking, the action, taking action is really the only way that we're going to find out um, whether things could be better. Well, if anyone would, as I mentioned, if anyone wants to reach out or make a time to have a, a direct conversation, please do. Um, you know, um, if you go just on the Geelong Chamber website, there's a wellbeing button um, and you can uh, tap on that. And yeah, you can see just down the bottom there, there's a calendar option. So that will give you an option to make a, to make a time. <laughs>